I never got the validation. So we have a layer of bitterness. Bitterness and rage. You fucking cowards. You fucking goddamn cowards. You want all this from us. And you want a final clause in the contract. This never happened. This never happened. It was all the children's fault. This will never be talked about. No one will ever know. No one will ever empathize with the children who were systematically raped, violated, abused, silenced, shamed, and then blamed for it all. No one, because it never happened. That's the final contract clause. <sighs> The sigh, the sigh, the sigh of the helpless parent, of the martyr. You're going to bring up that again. What are you going to do on the other side of that? Yeah, you fucked up piece of shit. Oh, you're so juvenile. You're so juvenile. You're so juvenile. Oh, we did the best that we could. Why do we have to? Oh, poor me. I have to listen to the, the truth. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. Let me go to another channeling session. Have another massage. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. Oh. We gave them the best years of our lives, but it's not enough. It's not enough. We did all this for you. You know what's waiting for you. And what about everyone else, right? They're so excited to learn why you can't think, why you can't feel, why you have ADHD, why you have this and that and the other. They're so excited. Oh, drama, drama. Oh, my goodness. Where can I escape this drama? Where can I be with other sociopaths who pretend that they don't have any baggage? Oh, my goodness. Oh, you're one of the cool crowd. Yes, we make sociopathic remarks and witty things and put other people down who have feelings as well. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Thank goodness. And with a real human being, until, until of course, it's, it, they're betrayed. You know, their feminine self comes out. Uh, I thought they were such a cool human being. My goodness, my goodness. They were betrayed. The bitterness, the disgust, the loneliness starts to really set in. No matter what I do, no matter what I do, this part is never going to be loved. The parents are never going to connect emotionally. They're never going to love each other. They're never going to love themselves. They're never going to love me. They're never going to love my siblings. And they're never going to own up to that reality. They're never going to deal with the truth. It's so painful. It's so painful because the sacrifice is so deep, because the humiliation is so deep. Within the shame that we associate as a cult with powerlessness. You see, as the growing conscious mind can go back to that point, it can acknowledge, I was powerless. But the cult is waiting with a dump truck load of shame. It's perfectly fine for you to say you were powerless and had no control and were helpless and all that. Go ahead, say that. You as a five-year-old were powerless and helpless and blah, 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 blah. And you as a 44-year-old, 70% of your... Go ahead, say it. We have, uh, we have a little surprise for you. It's called a cultural shame. It's called chauvinism. Anyone who needs help and isn't helped is inferior. Anyone who is helpless is inferior. 
Anyone who needs is inferior. Anyone who has emotional needs, feminine needs, very, very, very inferior. And by the way, your revelation that you need massive amounts of help, ring on the bell for the 10,000th time, is not going to trigger a single fucking idiot in our cult to respond to the help because that would be intelligent and that would encourage other people to ask for help and we do not want to do it. What we want to do is encourage people to shut up and talk about how happy they are with their gratitude diaries and being positive and blah, 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 blah. That's what we want people to do because then we don't have to help them. We don't have to deal with our own helplessness and we don't have to deal with our own cultural incompetence. We don't have to deal with our emotional illiteracy, our psychological illiteracy, our traumatic illiteracy, and actually do anything about it. We don't want to do anything about it. It's scary. It's unknown. We might feel shame too. So you go ahead, do all that. We're going to lift slowly, lift the dump truck load. You think maybe something good is going to come out. Ding, you know, it's going up, going up. The gate opens up and a whole shitload of coal and all the commiserating coughing dust comes out and covers you all over. And the truck drives off. And if you haven't got the message, shut the fuck up and don't you ever talk about the betrayal, the genocide of your emotional soul, of your feminine side. If you haven't gotten the message by now, well, it's unspeakable. It's beyond the pale. <laughs> what the fuck is that? But we watch this dynamic as people are dismissed in our cult. Of course, they didn't stop. It was a homeless person. It's one of those has feelings. Bizarre. Who, who knew that uh, half of the human psyche existed in many cultures in human history before our own? Who knew? My goodness. Primitives, barbarians, dance all night have feelings, get the biology of trauma out of their system after death, etc. Dance all night, sing, chant, bond. Barbarians. Barbarians who had the audacity to penetrate the feminine wound, to champion and embody honor for the feminine psyche. Well, with barbarians like this, why, why shouldn't we just massacre, massacre them and, and treat them as inferiors and take over an entire continent of emotionally superior human beings, of people that were not afraid of their full range of emotions and had superior technology at embodying and honoring and through that superior technology, a more intelligent lifestyle, consuming less energy, less carbon fit footprint per unit of well-being. They didn't need a gym in their culture. They lived an embodied life. They didn't need therapists in their culture. They participated in the circle of rituals. They did not need environmentalists to tell them that killing the feminine womb out of which all species are born is a bad idea. Their ecological footprint was 10,000 times 10,000 times smaller than our own. Depression, not such a big thing amongst 20% of our Native American ancestors. Gratitude diaries did not need to be prescribed when a bow was offered at every meal to the Great Mother to the provider. 
when we slaughter their cult, their culture. We reenact the slaughter of our own feminine psyche. It was as nothing because what had been there in that region in our own world was already dead, was already dissociated from and self-referentially, self-referentially diminished. It's a very important distinction in scientific terms because a scientist cannot say that something is acid because it is acid, because I said it was acid, because something is acid. A scientist actually has to take a reading, has to create a metric for measuring degrees of acid that is big enough to contain the full continuum of things that they measure and actually has to take relative acidic readings of many objects to determine the relative acidity. It's not a self-referential loop. It's acid because I said it was acid, and I said it was acid because it was acid. It's, it references something other, something outside, something ecological. It's not self-referential. Cults are self-referential. You know, because you know. Homeless, you know, yeah, yeah, you know. They're self-referential because they're self-referential, because they're afraid of the unknown, and because they're terrified of data. There have been 10,000 cults in human history, 10,000 languages, 10,000 paradigms and ways of exploring things. Show me the cult that did a global survey at any given point and measured relative well-being to its protocols, to its units of energy invested. Show me the cult in any of those 10,000 cults who sent out a survey and said, this cult takes one gallon of gasoline and creates this amount of well-being from it. This cult creates, takes this amount of gasoline and creates this amount of misery with it. Who is the superior cult in that equation? If you're referencing intelligence, the efficiency with which energy, time, money, and natural resources are transformed into human well-being. If you're referencing intelligence, the one that takes a gallon of gasoline to create one unit of well-being rather than two units of misery, is more intelligent. The one who takes no gallon of gasoline and creates three units of well-being is more intelligent still. It's more efficient. That is the metric for intelligent, the efficiency with which energy is transformed into human well-being. The cults that do not measure and do not gather data and do not respond to data are self-referential. This is the will of God because we said it is the will of God because we wrote it in the book and called it the will of God and it is how things will be done. Now, if you don't like the fact that there are no female high priests or popes or anything, go fuck yourself. We don't care about the data. This is the way it was done because it was done that way because we said it was done that way and it will be done that way because that's what cults do, protect us from the unknown, protect us from change, however intelligent that change or unintelligent that change may be. It is not an outward-looking science. It is a self-referential wound. A cult is a wound to protect us from the trauma of the unknown that the most unintelligent cults do not study. Now, I travel around the world and one of the ways I measure how intelligent a cult is, is by how interested they are in me, because I am the other. 
Thailand ranks highest. People are not afraid of me. That's huge. Of all ages, they're not afraid of me. Of both sexes, they're not afraid of me. That is huge because I am more frightening in the cult that I represent than most of them. But they are not afraid. They are, cu they are curious and they learn things. That's huge because it shows other-centric, which is the most intelligent direction. 99.9% .9 of all energy and all knowledge, knowledge is in the unknown. If you are self-centric, you're dealing with less than 1% of 1% of reality. If you're other, you're open to 99.9%. .9 Albert Einstein said the most important question to ask was whether the universe was a friendly place. Because if it is an unfriendly place, and by definition it is vastly bigger than we are, we should be afraid and relate to the reality with fear, and we will. If we are afraid of the unknown, we will re relate to reality with fear because 99.9% .9 of reality is unknown. And it takes an incredible amount of artificial myopia to stay trapped within the little cult border. I had dinner with my wife last night in Mill Valley. And the couple next to us spent the entire dinner referencing their different preferences for wines. We see eye to eye on most things, but I don't think we're ever going to agree on Chardonnay. This was it. This was the conversation. They were, of course, completely politically correct, wearing all the right makeups and perfumes and jewelry and this and that and the other. They had all the correct mannerisms, and they were completely absorbed in their cult. The question is, how bored were they? Was there any sense of vitality or sense of self outside of that reference point? Who do they think they are if one day they woke up and they weren't in a materialistic, chauvinistic, American 21st century, who would they be? Who's there outside of the cult paradigm? And would they welcome that part of themselves in to the guest house? Or keep the door locked to stay small in the tiny little bit of the tiny little bit. The point is, if you travel the world, you will notice that everyone does something better than we do. Everyone does something better than we do. The Thais smile 300% better than we do, with heart. The Thais laugh 300% better than we do, with heart. The Thais house their citizens. They don't have homeless people. I can't find any in Thailand. I find them in the richest uh, counties in the United States. They house their homeless people simply by not having housing regulations that stop them from building homes. You see, they don't have a government agency that says, uh, you're, sleeping, uh, you're sleeping under a tree in a park, uh, uh, You've, we've, you've got to be evicted from your tree. But much more importantly, you don't need a permit to build a little bamboo or tin hut. So if you don't need a permit to build a $300 hut, and nobody likes being in the rain, not in the 4th century, not in the 20th century, not in the future, not 10,000 years ago, nobody likes being in the rain, when your government does not stop you 
from building a little hut to get out of the rain, everyone does it, and they get out of the rain. And that's what a home is, a safe, legal place to sleep that you feel welcome. Millions of Americans don't have that. Millions of Americans do not have that. They do in Thailand for $300 a pop. Easy, if their government gets out of the way. Everyone does something better than we do. Everyone. Denmark pays its people to go to college. Thousand bucks a month if you go to college. Surprise, surprise, I didn't meet a single Danish person that I interviewed who hadn't gone to college. Amazing, right? Cults don't reference data. They don't reference the outside. Family cults do not reference data. You don't hear dad saying, well, I went over to Joey's dad and he's able to have feelings for some reason and he isn't hit for having feelings. Why don't we adopt that in our house? Uh, that's a better family uh, system than ours. Um, I don't know where we came up with this family system. I wasn't allowed to have feelings in my family. My dad wasn't allowed to have feelings in his family. Uh, but uh, they're not all that bad. Uh, let's have some feelings. Everyone have a vote? Anyone want to go over to Joey's house, reference the data, look outside? No, 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 no. It's terrifying. It's unknown. The world is a scary place. We don't have feelings because we don't have feelings, and I said so, and that's it. Now, move on if you don't want to be hit. Okay? Fine. All right. Bullying at, a, at an early age, starting with dad, starting with mom. Amazing, all this bullying in school, right? Where does it come from? It just comes out of the blue. You know, it's like, these poor parents. Why can't they bully their children and then send the children to school and, and have, have them learn not to bully children with teachers that have no interest in learning that either and that are spread out in this bizarre protocol where where you're prepared for life in the most artificial environment we can construct. We're going to prepare you for life. Uh, okay, okay, so you're going to mix us with multiple ages. You're going to have us do productive, useful things. You're going to have us learn feelings. We're going to spend time in our homes and in our businesses where we live our lives. No, 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 no. We, we have another way we're going to prepare you for life. We're going to prepare you for life by taking you away from life. Now, we've got to build special buildings that have nothing to do with life. Uh, you're never going to visit them for the rest of your lives, but we're going to prepare you for life here. Now, these buildings have to be specially constructed at great expense. They have to sit empty most of the year at great expense, so we're all going to have to raise our taxes. You know, come on, do your part for the civic duty of a cult. Doesn't know what it's doing. Now, then you're going to have to build special buses that are going to sit around 90% of the time. These are going to be some of the most inefficient buses ever constructed. You should see the gas mileage on these buses that drive around half empty, taking up traffic. And then, this is all preparation for a great life, by the way, and then, then we're going to have you drive and waste lots of your time driving to some place you're never going to spend any time with in the rest of your life. And then you're going to learn subjects, most of which you are never going to use and apply for the rest of your life. And you're going to be segregated by age, and you're going to be treated like robots. You're going to be bullied in this and that and the other, and you're going to have to shut up about it because then you'll be bullied some more. And that's your preparation for life. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That's, I mean, who are these people coming up with these brilliant plans? Stunning. Stunning. Gold medalists, for sure. I mean, how to waste as much money as possible taking everyone in the culture out of the culture to dissociate them from life and then be told that we love you and that's why we're doing this to you. My goodness, my goodness. Love is a scary thing. <sighs> By 10, I didn't like it anymore. There was a bribery going on. You see, once I learned to think a little bit, I could be sarcastic towards my parents. They didn't like it, of course. So, a little bit of a bribery. 
You know, say when a child has a weapon that can actually penetrate the self-absorption of the parent, my goodness, now they've got to be taken into a consideration. Their feelings aren't to be taken into consideration, but our the fact that they're hurting us, a very important milestone in a, in a child-parent relationship, my goodness, they can hurt us. Oh my goodness. So I used that ability to secure favorable position. I'm in the elder status, you know, I've got the biggest body, so they were wanting to get my cooperation, not to poke at any of their stupidity, not to make things too difficult in the family, so it's a bribery position. I get superior status out of sheer extortion because that's the only way to secure some sense of meaning and relevance in a dysfunctional cult like this. Okay. We're not going to give you for your four or five-year-old any love and affection. We're not going to acknowledge any of the things that you did. We're not going to own that all this shadow stuff that you're expressing came from the family system and the cult system. No, no, no. That's all your fault. But now you can needle us a little bit about some of this. Okay, I guess we're going to have to uh, pay you some deference. How much do you want? It's a bribery game. You turn a human being into a gang member who learns that their feelings don't matter. That feelings don't matter, not in this cult. But that bribery matters, extortion matters. Why? Because it doesn't matter when you're in grief and terror. It doesn't matter when you're sacrificing this. It doesn't matter when you're developing learning disabilities in the traumatic dynamic. None of that matters. What matters is making the parent look good. But now that you can figure out how to make the parent look bad, now it matters that you don't exercise that power. So you don't hit on us and we'll give you uh, little treats. And your siblings will learn from that because we're still going to abuse them. We're still going to abuse them and we're not going to give them the treats. So they're going to learn that they have to be like you and extort the parents or they're not going to get any treats either. So the whole sibling is going to have to wrestle with the fact you must be a gang member and extort your parents or you are not going to get treats. Well, the whole siblings, of course, do learn that and figure out how they're going to extort the parents in different ways. Oh, the poor parents. Um, but by 10-year-old, I would actually say maybe 11. I didn't enjoy the... I didn't enjoy the contract. I have to be a... pretend to be bad to get attention. Then I have to not say this to get little treats, then I have to uh, not talk about any of this so my parents can feel superior, then I have to not do this, then I have to hurt my siblings from time to time if they get too emotional because that's my, been my assigned role. Uh, and uh, besides, I, uh, I, you know, and it's aggravating as hell that I've been somewhat because now I know how to scare the parents at 10, 11 years old with the truth, which is terrifying to any shame-based, shadow-based cult and parent. Now that I know how to scare the parents, now the parents are teaching the siblings a dual role. He's scary and somehow bad. We can't cross Dane, right? Um, but we're going to give him more treats and teach you all that if, if you don't do this, and this and this like Dane does, you're going to be just as irrelevant as you are. So I'm in the bad guy again kind of message. Not spoken out loud, but just the, 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 the looks. The, the turning away. The I don't want to see you because I don't want to see this part of myself. There's a deep wound and there's a deep shame in a child that needs love and belonging to have this continual dance going on throughout the years in which the parent induces a persona that is necessary to survive in that environment. 
and then having induced the persona, turns away, turns away, turns away and says, I don't love that persona. That persona doesn't belong in this family. I don't want to see it in me, myself, so I won't honor it in you. Most importantly, I will not on, honor that it was evoked. That in a healthy family that loved and responded to the four and five-year-old and didn't traumatize them in the first place, this stuff doesn't happen. That this is not a healthy family and that this is not a healthy cult that produces families that aren't healthy. But all of that denial pattern, I mean, you don't, this is one of the saddest things I think about the U.S. government. It doesn't apologize for its cruelty. It does not apologize to the cru for its cruelty to its people or to the world. It does not say, we feel the pain of the people that were disappeared by the dictator we propped up. And we are sorry that we did not have a better way to secure oil rights than by propping up a dictator that murdered your husbands. We are sorry about the consequence of our agenda and the sophistication or lack of it with which we carried our agenda out. This was our agenda. We did put the price of oil ahead of everything else in your country. And thousands of people have lived in trauma and terror because of our expediency. And we are sorry that our sophistication is so little, is so low, that that was the only way that we knew how to secure that agenda. One. And two, we are sorry that shaving a few pennies off of a gallon of gasoline was more important than the dignity of millions of people. We are sorry for the sophistication of our implementation strategy, and we are sorry for the sophistication of our value hierarchy. And we are sorry for the sociopathic ethic of our people and our government. A people who will vote on economic lines and who will punish the president who does not deliver the economy at whatever cost. And we are sorry that our people do not associate themselves with even our own policies. They don't want to read the laws. They don't want to know. They're quite fine with a trillion dollar budget going to black op operations that we don't even know we don't even know. Quite fine with whatever that may or may not be doing that with that. They don't want to rock the boat. It's not part of the value hierarchy. I don't want to be a target. I want to benefit from this system. So I have never written a letter that would be ignored because we all know that we all know that money is more important than human beings. And so we're not going to do something intelligent and decent in El Salvador that might cost a few points in a swing state? Uh, no, 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 no. Money before human beings. It's what we live by in our families, in our cult, in our government. And we're sorry that we're so out of it that we don't even know that we don't know that. I'm sorry. Now, would the president that apologizes be elected, or would he be revealing the shame within each one of us and be intolerable? A humiliation. 
This is an interesting question. Page 11 or so, I didn't want to play the game. I didn't know how to stop because I didn't know where all the levers were within my psyche. So I just slowly began to withdraw. I didn't like who I'd become in my cult and in my family. I didn't like it. I wasn't proud of it. I felt a mild disgust with who I had to be to belong. So I stopped belonging and started taking a different course, started reading, studying, spending more time alone, reading books. I started taking a different course and withdrawing from the family is the only way that I knew how to withdraw from my programming that was never acknowledged in the first place. The intense, traumatic, brainwashing program that it takes to turn an innocent, sensitive boy into this guy was never acknowledged. So you can't deprogram what is pretended to be an eight. So the deprogramming is a lot more unconscious and a lot more dissociative. I simply began to move away further and further and further until I left home at 17. And then move away from contact because Contact with a parent or sibling is conditional on, on terms. This cannot be talked about, and I knew that. So when my mother would call me, oh, can we reconnect? I'd say, of course we can, but you don't want to hear what I'm connected with. And I cannot reconnect to the lies that you're protecting. You can connect with lots of people who will give you the invisibility you desire. I'm not going to give you that. So you cannot connect with me. Oh, I can, I can. Let's see how long this lasts. I remember the most direct time we had that conversation, one sentence. One sentence is how long that lasted. And she was outraged. I said, Mom, there's a lot more where that came from. You sure you want to connect to me? Because you hate every truth that you've put in my body. And every truth that I know, you hate me. You would rather get rid of me so as to avoid these truths than you'd rather be close to me and deal with them. And that is the betrayal of a mother who induces and stands by terror and will not, not then, not now, not any point in between, help that four and five-year-old out of the pit. If you can deal with the grief that a human being would feel about having, inducing, having induced that in a four and five-year-old helpless boy in the isolation of your wilderness without support, without grandparents, uncles, friends, etc., to... Protect me from yourselves. If you can know how much my body has carried that until the present time, and cry with me, then you could be something other than a sociopathic influence, pressuring me into silence to preserve your dissociation, your numbness, your lack of response. Because I don't think you do want to change the way you think, the way you feel, the way you live your life. It's very known to you. And you're so terrified of your own traumas, you're afraid of the unknown. Like us all, this is not personal.
when I speak from this place and you get on with your day, you violate the sanctity of the spring, of the source. When you bow down and change who you are, your persona, to return back to the innocence that was lost, you pray to the goddess that I worship and that I have betrayed to fit into your home. The feminine archetype, the beauty, you have the beauty and you have the truth, the feminine, the masculine, the goodness, the synergy, the beauty, the truth, the synergy that is the goodness. Beauty, truth, and goodness, the trinity, that most sacred, that which we all have always sought when we exit from under the thumb of terror, trauma, and the biological message that I feel in so many of the moments of my life that I'm going to die, 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 that I'm going to die. I'm going to be hit, I'm going to be hated, I'm going to die. As we exit the psychotic wound of our cult and shift from an aversion, a fear-based software, of navigating reality that I have used my entire life to a growth-based software, to a becoming, to a to an embrace of the universe, the unknown, that is a friendly place. We all gravitate to the same trinity. 10,000 cultures, 10,000 languages, 10,000 words, beauty, truth, goodness, the structure, the truth, the thought, the masculine, the beauty, the beauty of truth, the same information registered through the human heart. It's beautiful. It's mathematical. It's true. It's beautiful. The goodness that comes in the synergy of the masculine and the feminine. The beauty, the truth, the goodness that emerges in a cult that teaches emotional, psychological, mythological, cultural literacy, traumatic literacy, abuse literacy. That teaches these feminine topics, that honors them, the synergy that opens up is thousands of times more intelligent than the cult, than the reality, than the protocols offered to us in our cult today.